A lot of you will know this. I'm shameless when it comes to this charity. I'm a trustee of Bermadent. We facilitate dentists to go to Burma and treat mainly orphans like these. If any of you are the slightest bit interested, then uh, come and grab me in the coffee break or speak to Mike Clark, who's also from London, who's also a trustee sitting down there. Thank you for the introduction, Joe, and thank you for a great speech last night. Um, I'm chairman of the General Dental Practice Committee, and I'm here to talk a bit about, uh, well, what we are doing and what we are trying to do uh, at GDPC. Okay. I don't know, was that mm, meant for me, that whistle there? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Darling. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> that got me out of it a bit here. All right. Um, I'm going to try and concentrate this around uh, some of the motions from, from uh, last year's conference. So I'm going to talk a bit about contract reform. I'm going to talk a bit about DDRB, Capita, PCSE, and something about the, uh, the LDC levy. So the first one, conference believes the evidence used by the Department of Health prototype team to cite success takes no account of the financial consequences for those practices reaching their targets. It's, for, uh, it's from Northumberland, uh, LDC. Um, and Joe touched on it yesterday uh, in his speech. There are quite a few of the prototypes uh, that might have reached their targets, that might not face clawback, but will have had to um, employ extra staff, um, put in an extra surgery, uh, extra nurses, whatever it is, which means that their, their profit margin has gone down considerably. The evaluation report that has just come out, and we talked a little bit about that yesterday uh, with Eric Rooney, um, one of the recommendations in that report is actually that DH needs to look at this and find out uh, how much extra money is being spent in practices uh, that they think are a success. Because obviously, if we're going to spend a hell of a lot more money uh, to reach the targets, then that is not uh, a successful practice. Uh, we need to be able to to make it financially viable. And so that thing was put in. Uh, Richard Ems was, was part of, of uh, doing the evaluation report uh, and managed to get that and other things uh, into the recommendations. Uh, the next one is from Durham and Darlington, LDC. Uh, the current contract reform process has developed a good clinical pathway and philosophy, but targets based on historic activity <clears throat> are not giving practices enough time to deliver the real preventative mess change to help move away from treatment treadmill dentistry. We urge the contract reform program to find a new measure of activity and give us time to be able to deliver it. Uh, absolutely uh, agree with that as well. Um, and we have talked about that we want to, to get rid of the UDAs. Uh, you have got a paper uh, in your delegate pack um, about the contract reform and what it is we are trying to uh, to push the Department of Health and NSS England uh, to do in relation to the contracts. So what is it we actually uh, tell them? What is it we want? Well, we want, and we talked a little bit about that yesterday, Colette was, was mentioning the headspace uh, that they, um, they, are, uh, they get in, in, in Wales. We want the access target lowered. I'm not pernickety about how they do it, uh, but that's what we need. One of the suggestions we have suggested to them is that um, they keep the access target uh, as the patients you've seen in the past 24 months, but they give us uh, three years to reach the target. They give us that little bit of extra time to do the prevention. It is a lowering of the access target that is true. It is not a 50% lowering of the access target. It's probably somewhere in the region of six, eight, ten percent or something like that. Um, but it will help and it will give the practices that are finding it very difficult to hit their target that little bit of extra time, that little bit of headspace to do it. The other advantage of doing this is that one of the problems we are finding um, with the prototypes are particularly the, the, the prototypes where there is a lot of churn, where they have to see a lot of new patients, because the new patients uh, generally will have a tendency of being more high needs and therefore take longer. And particularly with this, you will, uh, you will help the practices with a lot of churn. Because 
for practices with a very stable population, this is not going to do very much because you will see most of your patients anyway in the two-year period. So whether it's two or three years you've got to do it, doesn't matter that much. The ones that's going to help is the, are the ones with a lot of straddlers, a lot of people that only come when they are in pain, uh, that don't attend every two or three years, but might do it every five or every ten. And they're going to be helped by this one. So it helps the practices with a lot of churn. It helps practices that have to see a lot of, of, of people uh, with high needs, uh, uh, a lot of patients uh, with high needs. The other thing that we <clears throat> are saying very clearly is that we need a gradual rollout. And I have to say this is probably where we agree uh, completely with the Department of Health. Uh, for those of us um, that have got grey hair, and I think probably we got the grey hair because of the 2006 contract, um, but we can remember when that came in and it was like falling off a cliff. Uh, it was completely ridiculous uh, and nobody wants a repeat of that, including the Department of Health. So we need a gradual rollout, uh, and whether that's going to be over three years or five years or whatever, that's to be discussed, but it needs to be gradual. We can't fall off a cliff again. We need an income guarantee. Um, the doctors had it uh, when they got their new contract in, 1990, in 2004. Uh, they had what was called an MPIC, a minimum practice income guarantee. Um, the Department of Health gets slightly twitchy when I use the word MPIC because uh, they didn't like it at all. Uh, again, I'm not pernickety about what they call it, but we need some income guarantee. It is not reasonable that uh, we are the ones that need to carry the financial risk of changing the system. That financial risk needs to be carried by the Department of Health and NSS England. So we need to make sure that practices will continue being financially viable uh, after uh, this is brought in. We need weighted capitation. Weighted capitation at the moment uh, has been, well not at the moment, but when the pilots, the weighted capitation was relating to age, sex and deprivation. It's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to uh, reflect the need of the patient so that high needs patients will be weighted higher than low needs patients. So if you have a patient where it takes you half an hour to finish the course of treatment, and another patient where it takes you two hours to finish the course of treatment, then the patient that takes two hours should be weighted four times as much as the one that takes half an hour. That would help with the problem about uh, the most needy patients being the least uh, welcome in our practices. Because it doesn't really matter to us whether we need to see four patients doing half an hour work on each one, or we need to see one patient uh, for two hours. It doesn't matter to us. We are being paid for the work we do. So therefore, whether they're high needs or low needs shouldn't matter. We need weighted capitation and we need the weighted capitation to reflect how long time it takes us to do the work. And the other thing <clears throat> uh, that has been discussed, obviously, as you're all aware, we are pushing very hard for 100% capitation. However, we have been told very clearly by the Department of Health that it's not going to happen. They say that going from a purely activity-based system, as we've got now with the UDAs, to a purely capitation-based system is too big a step for them. They don't want to do it. So they are saying that there will be some sort of activity measure. We are not agreeing with it, but if there is going to be some sort of activity measure, then we want it to be uh, more granular or, or even go back to item of service. Again, that will help uh, the patients with, with higher needs because it means that you are actually being paid more for doing four fillings than you are for doing one filling. And can I just say um, the reason why it is so important that we get this reform contract off the ground has to do with how shitty the UDA contract is, particularly now and particularly getting worse and worse and worse. These figures are slightly different from what you might have seen before because these only relate to standard UDA contracts. Um, all the stuff about UOAs, domiciliary sedation, have been taken out of these figures. So these are standard UDA contracts. In 1516, 25% um, of practices, 25% of UDA practices face clawback, and the amount was £49 million. In 1617, 30% of practices face clawback, and the total amount was £74 million. 
That is, according to Tom King, who has done the figures here, that is a clawback. That's a 51% increase in the amount of clawback in one year. A 51% increase in one year. So, where we are going to end up with this, I don't know. But we really, really do need to get this reform contract off the ground. The next motion. This conference believes that until the limits on, of the Treasury on public sector pay are lifted, there should be non-engagement with the DDRB, which is clearly not independent. Instead, uh, we should negotiate directly with NSS England, Department of Health, and ballot the workforce on the offer made from these negotiations. That's from Birmingham LDC. And GDPC discussed this um, very, very thoroughly at the October meeting. Uh, and if you look at it, it's, it's to do obviously with the pay cap uh, and also a bit about the experience uh, negotiating, if you can call it that, with the Department of Health. So, what did we want to achieve? Did we want this to achieve, to have an impact on the Department of Health, on the DDRB, or giving us some publicity to the public? We know that DDRB at the moment are not fulfilling their task. We were told 10 years ago that we would face a pay freeze. Thank you very much. We would like the pay freeze. Instead, we have faced a 35% reduction in take-home pay. So the DDRB are not doing what they're supposed to do. The problem with the pay cap, when we discussed it in October, was whether the pay cap had been lifted. The politicians were talking a lot about lifting the pay cap. Um, however, and I have to be honest with you, I'm not, still not quite sure whether they have lifted it for doctors and dentists or not. Uh, so that was, was one of the questions. But the other problems we were facing was the Department of Health were very clear that they were going to give evidence to the DDRB anyway, which meant that if we didn't give evidence, then DDRB would come up with a recommendation, but only based on the evidence from the Department of Health. And as you are have heard earlier on the Department of Health are telling us, or told DDRB then, that there is absolutely no recruitment problem in dentistry. The other problem for, DD, for, for GDPC was that Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales told us very clearly that they were going to give evidence anyway. So the dental practice committees in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales were going to give evidence anyway. So what we were discussing was an English only uh, thing. And that obviously makes it slightly more difficult to make a lot of publicity about DDRB not being fit for purpose if the rest of the BDA uh, are giving evidence to them, uh, including the other craft committees. So the salaried services were going to give evidence, the hospitals, uh, the academics were all going to give uh, evidence um, to the DDRB. And then negotiations with the Department of Health. We have negotiated with the Department of Health about expenses for a number of years. Negotiations take place in the sense that what they do is they put the figures into the formula that is a leftover from when DDRB did the expenses. However, they're not using the same figures as we want to use. They have abating the staff costs, for instance. We know that we paid, and we can prove that we paid over 2% uh, increase in staff costs. Um, DEH are telling us that Nobody in the NHS should have more than a 1% pay rise. That was last year. And um, we then argue that our staff are not NHS employees. They do not have all the benefits from NHS employment. They do not have the pensions, the sick leave, all that sort of stuff. And the Department of Health are telling us that that might be, but they're still going to abate it to 1%. Uh, they are uh, also using CPI as the inflationary measurement rather than RPI and you're not going to get a price to work out which one is the lowest. We then come up with all the arguments for why they are wrong, and the final answer is that might be, but that is what they have been told by the Treasury. So there aren't any negotiations as such, and negotiating with the Department of Health uh, instead of DDRB uh, is probably not going to give us any more uh, money uh, and could very well give us less. So what happened then was the GDPC decided with an overwhelming majority to submit evidence to the DDRB again. We uh, went in April to give oral evidence. We gave written evidence in December. 
We went in April to give oral evidence, led by uh, Eddie Crouch as chairman of, of ARBEC. We have not heard what we're going to get yet. Um, I mean, I wouldn't spend it all at once, let's put it that way, but I think DDRB was listening more this year than they have done before. Um, whether or not it's going to show in the pay packet, uh, we don't know yet. We have heard that they are going to give their report uh, to the government by the middle of June. Next one. Demon LDC asks this conference to call for a vote of no confidence in the ability of Capita to process performer number applications in a timely, efficient and professional manner from Devon LDC. Well, again, I mean, it's obvious that Capita uh, should have an R in it. Um, they have been completely useless. Um, we have asked for, uh, for all these performer list uh, applications to be taken in-house uh, for NHS. We sent a letter to, to Simon Stevens asking about that. So as the doctors uh, and the pharmacists, it is probably not going to happen, but we've asked for it. What we are hoping a bit for is that the PLVE applications, which are the ones uh, for foreign doctors that have done the ORE and need to do equivalents, um, that those applications will be taken back in-house, uh, simply because it's NHS England doing most of the work anyway. So trying to cut capita out of it might be a good idea because it'll speed things up considerably. The other problem we've had, of course, with Capita particularly, is around the FDs. Um, they have um, excelled in being useless when it came to the FDs. And their latest brainwave uh, was that they were going to, they want to, to put the performer list online, uh, and they were going to do that uh, on the 20th of August, which is obviously the time when all the FDs uh, are finishing and therefore have to get on a performance list. So we could see impending doom coming in. Nilis Patel and, and Alex Chenik uh, have done a lot of work uh, on this one and hopefully have managed to, to dissuade them from that completely stupid idea. Uh, so that will be done uh, at a different time. You're hopefully also all aware that performers that have had problems with the, with the performance list applications um, are entitled to apply for a goodwill payment uh, if they have been delayed more than 16 weeks uh, and the goodwill payment uh, should be £2,000 per month up to a maximum of £10,000. Uh, it's the same uh, rule for the other, um, for the other contractors, doctors and, and opticians and, and pharmacists. We've obviously argued that we don't know why £2,000 is the maximum since that actually is not the amount that you would earn if you did uh, work. Um, we also don't understand why 16 weeks when the KPI for, for capita is to uh, process these applications until 12 weeks. And we also don't know why there's a uh, maximum of £10,000 on it. As I said, it's the same for the other uh, contractors. So whether or not we're going to change it, I don't know. What we are hoping for is actually uh, that we've argued very clearly that within dentistry, uh, the money is normally split between the performer and the provider. Uh, so actually the provider should be entitled to the same goodwill payment. Um, whether or not we will manage that, I don't know, but we are pushing very hard for it. Oops, I need to go back. How do I do that? Yeah. Okay, this one here. Norfolk LDC. This conference demands that individual LDCs be able to set their own levy independent from other LDCs that they have been grouped with. That's from Norfolk. And again, obviously agree totally. It is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger problem. There are LDCs out there that have got far too much money in their accounts and there are LDCs that have absolutely no money in their accounts. And the problem is that they have to claim the same amount in the area they're in. We've had discussions with the BSA. Um, Nick Stoles and Will Newport have uh, had some technical discussions uh, about this. Um, it looks like there might be an opportunity uh, for doing something about it. What we need to ensure is that it's a long-term solution, not a short-term solution. And at the moment, there's obviously an argument about who's going to pay for the work that has to be done. Um, actually, it should be NHS England, uh, and we are very firm about that. Uh, but we need to sort out the technical discussions as well so we know how much it's going to cost and, and uh, how it's going to be done practically. But hopefully, hopefully, it will happen because it has to happen. LDCs cannot 
continue with having uh, too much money uh, and, and others uh, skimping and saving. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So we need to sort the problem out, and we are working very hard uh, at it. Hopefully, there will be some, something coming out of it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. <coughs> so there are microphones on the floor, number one and two. If uh, you'd like to step up to those, and uh, Henrik will take a few questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Henrik, looks as though you're off the hook. Oh, we got hey. one. Just state your name and your uh, LDC, please. Um, just a question on that weighted capitation that you talked about. You mentioned that the figures on weighted capitation will be based on a baseline. Who calculates that baseline? And how do you work it out? Uh, sorry, the baseline on the, on the um, form contract on the number of patients. You mentioned that you know, if there's more treatment on a patient required, you need more time to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And you get a little bit more money for that as well. So then you talk about a baseline that they base the, act the weighted capitation on. Yep. Where is that coming from? The original, um, when the pilot started, they used the weighted capitation. And what they did from memory, but remember, we are talking 10 years ago or something like that. From memory, they looked at, I believe, something like 5 million um, uh, courses of treatment that had been sent to the BSA and then they did an average on how much time had been spent um, on each patient and worked out the weighting uh, depending on age, sex and deprivation in accordance to that. That was how they, they, they worked it out. So it's not really a, a realistic value that you actually spend on a patient. It's just an average thing that is applied randomly to a practice. It, the number of patients in your practice is your, the number of patients in your practice. The weighting in itself and the way you weight one patient compared to another were, will probably not be, uh, be dependent on what you've got in your practice. The other option, of course, would be to weight them in accordance to DMFT or something similar uh, like that. That is another option. But I think what, what I'm very keen on, and I'm not a specialist on this, but what I'm very keen on is that the weighting will reflect how much time you spend on them. But it is technically difficult uh, to do that unless, unless you simply uh, do it by how much time you spend on each individual patient. I think you should take control over it. If you're not a specialist on it, go and buy professional service and ask them and to go through modeling and to see how that works out. Because all we're doing is we're actually following what the department is telling us to their modeling. Yeah. We're not actually taking control over it. Yeah. The reason for the age, sex and deprivation is that's what they're using for GPs. And that is to reflect the deprivation of it. And that is, unless we, unless we go to an individual patient, it's probably the deprivation that is the best measure of it. Uh, and that is, is what has been tried and tested with GPs. That's the age, sex and deprivation part of it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's reflect the deprivation, not the individual the treatment point. need of the patient. Just the last point. I think we are really geared towards what the department tells us every time. We're not ready to do it ourselves and go through buying professional service in to do the modeling for us so that we have something to talk about. And we're just following what's coming out of the figures nationally. We're not really taking control over it. And I think that we should do that a little bit more. We talk about financial sort of... Uh, uh, problems of doing for doing that, maybe you should ask the LDCs to contribute towards it. Right. Okay. Can we move on to microphone number one, Simon? Yes, Simon Flaherty. I'm chair of uh, Mid Mersey uh, LDC. Um, I'm a prototype practice and have been now since my third year. Um, I, I understand Joe's problems that he spoke about last night. Um, we're making a big success of prototype. My associates thank me every day when I come in that we've signed up. Um, to prototype. I know many practices that are in a similar position um, to ourselves. Um, don't you think that some work should be done analysing why businesses like mine are making a success of it and businesses like Joe's um, haven't made a success of it? I would love to 
know that and and looking at them i have i have spoken to to uh three quarters of the um of the wave three um prototypes uh and the problem a bit with the with the with the the wave threes is that only 20 of them so it's very difficult to get uh, a fixed thing i also have to say from from talking to him, i would love to do that and that is also one of the things that's in the, the in, in the evaluation report we need to try and find out what it is uh, i thought it was only high needs patients that would be the problem it doesn't look like it from the data uh, we've got but talking to the prototypes I think there are very individual reasons why some people are not hitting their targets and others are. I think there's one key element could be to do with whether you are spending more money in that sense, uh, one thing. But there are other issues. I mean, people can't get associates, they're, you know, um, death in the family. There are, you know, a lot of different reasons why. So it's very tricky, but I would really like to. I know, I, we have asked uh, the, the department and the number crunchers at the department to look into this uh, a lot more. Because if we could find that out, then it would also be a, a, a way of making sure that we could make a contract where the vast majority of people would actually be happy uh, with what is happening. Thank you. But thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just take one more question, number two. Uh, William Sidhu from Coventry LDC. Basically, Yes, you were mentioning about the percentage increase in Clobax. And uh, also on the other side, we got the percentage increase in patient charges by 5%. And we also talk about preventive dentistry, but where is the environment for uh, encouraging preventive dentistry when the Department of Health seems to be on a winner, taking the money away from the dental budget? and also deterring patients from having dental care? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the thing about why the clawback is there and why we have more and more clawback, I think there are a number of reasons. As you say, uh, patient charges might be one reason. I think recruitment is another reason. I think there are a lot of different reasons why more and more and more people are in clawback. The money they are taking out should go back into dentistry, definitely. But we know that the vast majority of it is used to, to uh, shore up other areas of, of uh, the NHS. We know that there are areas where the financial director actually has got a target for the dental commissioners for how much clawback they need to uh, provide uh, in a year. And it's, it's, it's completely unreasonable. Uh, and it's definitely not doing any good to uh, dentists nor to our patients. I'd like to thank Henrik for uh, giving the, the presentation.